turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 12. We're going everywhere today. Let's open up this portion of the service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we give you thanks and praise and glory and honor, Father, for who you are and who you are to us, the Holy One of Israel, the King of glory, the I am that I am, the higher than the highest and greater than the greatest, Jehovah God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, our God, our protector, our healer, our strength, our shield, the Lord of hosts. We worship you because you're worthy to be praised. You're so high and so great. We just give you praise and glory and honor. Lord, be with us through this portion of the service. Let this word minister to our lives and to our hearts. Let it change us and change our direction forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 12. If you have it, shout amen. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. The Bible says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Amen. The Bible has the dispensation of the patriarchs. It has the dispensation of Moses. And it has the dispensation of the last days. And we have been in the last days since Jesus shouted, It is finished. And we know that the Bible is clear that this world is going to be rolled up like a scroll. And it's going to be put away. It's going to be finished one day. Amen? So we are looking at the last days as a dispensation, but specifically, we're looking to the time of the end. And as it draws near, there are signs and things that we can see in the world around us. And one of them says, Many shall run to and fro. People be running around all over the place. Amen? you got a visa card. We can meet down at the airport, and I can take you, and you can be anywhere in the world in 24 hours. Just about anywhere you want to be. We can move to and fro in a way that mankind has never been able to move to and fro in thousands and thousands of years. Amen? It's only been maybe a mere 100, 150 years Since the automobile was invented, 1919, 1920, they started building automobiles in earnest. People walked everywhere they went or went on horseback. And the movement of mankind was slow. But in these last days, the Bible says, many shall go to and fro. And we're seeing it all around us. Just everybody almost has a car. You jump in the car, you can go anywhere you want to. Amen? It's a wonderful time to be alive. We have... Modern convenience like you could not imagine in the travel department. And knowledge shall be increased. Is that what your Bible says? Knowledge shall be increased. What do you want to, what do you want to know? You know? Let me Google it for you. Find out anything. You want to do a myomectomy? They got videos. They got how-tos. They got, I don't care what kind of surgery or procedure or mechanical or whatever it is you want to know about, you can jump on your phone and in a matter of moments you can have that information right there at your fingertips. And knowledge shall be increased. Amen? I believe that this Bible is talking about natural knowledge. Because we are not in a time or a place where the knowledge of the Word of God has covered the earth like a flood. It's more like a drought. Amen? People don't acknowledge God. They don't acknowledge His word anymore. Amen? What does it mean? Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, all the way on the other side of the Bible. 
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. I believe it's 2 Thessalonians. I think I wrote it down wrong. Bible says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting at verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them who trouble you. God is going to trouble your troublers in Jesus' name. People that want to give you trouble and, and trials and tribulations, He's going to deal with them in a way that you could never do. That's why the Bible says, vengeance is mine, say it the Lord. I will repay. God will deal with your enemies. You don't have to. Now he goes into the what's going to happen. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Jesus is coming. It's clear in the scriptures. The Lamb of God will return as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he will deal with your enemies as he deals with his enemies. Because they have made two camps. We have the camp of the people that are not the enemies of God, and you have the camp of the people that are the enemies of God, and the people that are the enemies of God, they are your enemies as well. And there's nothing they won't do and nothing they won't say to, to malign you or to trouble you. And God, when He returns in the power and the glory of His might, He's going to split that eastern sky and He's going to descend with a shout and He's going to deal tribulation to your enemies and they will not stand before Him. He will crush them and they will be destroyed forever in Jesus' name. The Bible says, Rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't know God. They don't want to know God. They think you're nuts coming to church and spending your time in the presence of the Lord. They don't want to stand with Him. They don't want to walk with Him. They don't want to know Him. They prefer to walk in darkness and walk in their evil and pernicious ways. Amen? God will take vengeance on them. There's that famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And by God, I'd be angry too. The amount of trouble that God went to for humankind to get us reconciled to Him. And man is standing there going, Nope, 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 nope. I don't want it. He sent His own Son to die on the Calvary's cross that we can be reconciled to God. And, and the humankind treats that as though it's in a base or an unclean thing. They don't want anything to do with it. They have walked away from God. And I promise you the vengeance of God shall chase them down and it shall pursue them and it shall overtake them and they will be separated from the presence of God and placed into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever and ever in Jesus' name. Amen. And we tell people this, by God, brother, you're a guilty, horrible human being. You've done all kinds of rubbish, all kinds of refuse. God is going to judge you seriously. You need to turn to Him and you need His mercy. Lord, let these people turn and see Your mercy in Jesus' name. But what I'm telling you is, no matter how much you beg with them, no matter how much you plead with them, I don't care if you're nice and you're sweet and you tell them, Oh, Mr. Sinnerman, you know, you should probably think about naming Jesus as your Savior. I don't care if you're nice to Him. I don't care if you flog Him over the head and tell them that God is going to deal with you, you wretched, refuse sinner man. I don't care how you present the Gospel to them. They don't want to listen. Amen? At the end of the day, God is going to deal with them. He's going to meet out vengeance on those that don't know Him, that don't pursue a knowledge of Him. And more importantly, they do not obey the Gospel of our Lord 
Jesus Christ. Amen? What is the Gospel? 1 Corinthians, the Bible says, chapter 15, the, the good news, the Gospel, is the death and the burial, and more importantly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That He proved Himself to be the Son of God with power by overcoming our number one enemy, which is death. And our duty is to say, oh yes, you are God indeed. You have overcome death and to turn from our wicked ways and pursue God with all of our hearts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If people will do these things, this world would be a beautiful place. But they're too enamored by the things of the world. They're too caught up in worldly things to understand what it is they need to do to get themselves right with God. They have not only not obeyed the gospel themselves, but they revile against everyone else who has wanted to um, obey the gospel. And they trouble us and they war against us. Amen? God will deal with them in flaming fire. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power? It's only right. It's right. They'll admit it on Judgment Day when God says, away from me, you evildoer, I never knew you. They will admit that that is right and that is just and that they have disobeyed God and they deserve to be placed in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever with the devil and his angels. Amen? What else? Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Stuff serious. Think we're here for nothing? I want to sit around saying happy, happy, joy, joy, and kumbaya with all of our friends so we can feel nice about ourselves? No. God has an agenda. He needs to wake us up. Amen? Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 11, the Bible says, and, I, and John is writing, and he says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Amen? A lake of fire. You think that's just hyperbole or just talk? God is just telling us that stuff to scare us and scare us into obedience? What He's saying, and I think is worse than the lake of fire, is that once you leave this earth, if you have not named Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're not walking with Him, God is going to separate you from His presence forever and ever and ever because you chose to walk outside of His presence. You chose to walk in darkness. You had nothing to do with God. You didn't want God while you were here. And you go to the funeral and you can find a reprobate sinner man that never walked with God in his life. And people will say, he's at rest. And they will say, surely he has gone to be with God. And the truth of the matter is, that man's not going to be anywhere near God. God has separate. He has separated Himself from God, and God said, "Well, you took your vote, and you decided you didn't want to be with me. Therefore, have it your way. You can have it that way forever." I tried to tell you. I sent my servants. We warned you seriously about the judgment to come, and you couldn't hear it. You were too busy in your sin and in your mess. Amen. Separated from God forever. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13 while we're here. Starting at verse 15.
and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause them, cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. People have wondered for thousands of years, what in the world is John talking about? There is no way that you could do that and track everything and have it be okay. But we're in the computer age now, and every government in the world and every um, every business in the world is busy right now building a database on you. They want to know where you live. They want to know how old you are. They want your financial details. They want to know your capacity. They want to know what you like and what you don't like. They want to know which way they lean and they will set their algorithms to reflect back to you exactly what it is you like. Amen? You involved in a deviant lifestyle? They're going to set their algorithms to reinforce that thought for you. And every video and every ad and everything you see is going to be set for deviant lifestyle. You want to buy a new BMW? And you start Googling BMWs? Next thing you know, every video and every ad and everything you look at is going to be all about BMW. Amen? I was in this church myself. I was talking to Paula. Talking to her. Not on the internet. Talking to Paula. And she was talking about her guppies. She got some guppy fish of some kind. I don't know anything about guppies. I don't care about guppies. I'll talk to you about your guppies if you want to, but okay. Just being polite. I get home, kick on YouTube. One of the first videos that pops up is all about guppies. I never Google searched guppies in my life. I never looked at guppies. I never cared about guppies. Somehow, Google knew that I said the word guppies with Paula. They're listening to us. You drive down the road. I've had it happen to me. You know, you're, you've got your GPS on. And uh, you're get, telling a guy, the guy's telling you, okay, go up three streets and you'll see a McDonald's. And take a right. And you, you might be 20 miles from your destination, but he's giving you the final directions to where it is you're going. Amen? So I'm sitting there, and the, the phone goes, there's a McDonald's on your right. Well, how the hell does it know I'm saying McDonald's? Because they're, they're following us. They're listening to us. They're tracking us everywhere they go. And it's not just the Chinese. The U.S. government's doing it too, and every other big organization, every other data horse that there is in the world they're following us. They're building a database. And I'm okay with it. You know, I like 23andMe and I like Ancestry.com because you're paying money to put your DNA in a database and that DNA information will be in there forever and there's no way you can ever delete it. Amen? And I'm okay with it to an extent. You know, you got a heinous criminal and all they got is data evidence and they want to narrow it down to what family he's out of and they can pull a warrant. And they can go into Ancestry.com and 23andMe and they can pull their database and they can find out what family the murderer is from. And I'm okay with it. But when you get that much power in so few hands, you have to remember that there have been horrific human beings on the face of the earth in time that if they had that much power, they would have destroyed everything and everybody that stood against them. You see, if Adolf Hitler had had 23andMe and had Ancestry.com, and could have gone into the database and found out who was Jewish. He would have been much more devastating than he, than he already was. Amen? So when they make laws against the church and make laws against our assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, when the world stands up and makes Christianity illegal, and then they can go through your search history and your video history, the things that you've been watching, you find out 
that they are going to use that database against you and they can use that information to round us up and execute us. And don't say it'll never happen. It'll never happen in this country. You wait and see what's going to happen because this is going to get really, really ugly. Amen? The second largest bank to fail since the Washington Mutual Bank failed, failed yesterday. And everybody's stepping and fetching because anybody that's associated with them, and believe me, there are a lot of companies that had money with um, Silicon Valley Bank that are no longer able to access their funds. There is going to be a lot of shouting and screaming the next few days, and there's going to be some liquidations, and things could get ugly. Is this the tipping point? I don't know. But our financial system is a house of cards. If something happens and that thing goes south, it can get real ugly. And we can see this mark of the beast being lined up. Okay, we're going to solve this problem. We're going to take all the world's assets and we're going to distribute to everybody equally. You're going to have enough food to eat. You're going to have a job to do. But we need you in our database. You think this is a joke? It's no joke. Revelation 18. Verse 2. I'll start in verse 1. The Bible says, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and, and, a, and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. Fallen, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Now Babylon is a type of the world system. It's an example of how people go to and fro and make money and do different things. And the Bible says that that Babylonian system is going to fall in one day. Just one day, suddenly, none of that stuff works anymore. Your ATM card doesn't work. Nobody takes your cash. Nobody wants your paper. It's fallen. Amen? The chaos ensues. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I mean, verse 16. The Bible says, all Scripture, say it with me, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, either it is or it isn't. Either this word is the inerrant word of God, this book is either the inerrant, divinely inspired, God-breathed word of God, or it's not. There's no ifs and ands or buts or halfway. It's either the word of God or it's not. And, the, and it is impossible for God to lie Therefore, it is impossible for this book to be incorrect. You with me so far? So if this is the Word of God, which I believe that it is, and I believe all of you also believe that it is, if this is the Word of God, and the Word of God says that this world system is going to collapse, this world system says that Jesus is coming again, if this world says it's coming pretty quick, what manner of people ought we to be? How shall we behave? How shall we be? What shall we be like? What's our lifestyle supposed to be? Amen? What about our friends? What about our families? What about our neighbors? What about our acquaintances that don't know God?
Love your neighbor as yourself. What do we do? Answer me. It's not a rhetorical question. What do we do? Leave them in their mess? Oh, well, I never really liked Bill that great anyway. I'm going to get saved. I don't care what happens to him. Is that what do we do? What do we do? What do we do, Devontae? What do we do? You got to warn them. Don't we have Do we, what I'm what I'm saying, do we have a responsibility as people that know what the word says to go out and try to warn these guys you better slow down? Don't we have an obligation to say, look, brother, the road is out, or the bridge is out in the road ahead. You're driving too fast. You're getting out of control. You need to chill. You need to stop and look at your life and stop and think about what it is you've been doing. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. we got to know this word. You know there's deceivers in the world. People say and do anything. Amen? Maybe they're just ignorant. Maybe the Bible colleges don't, just don't teach them well what the Bible says. You see, I'm more of an old country preacher who figured out what the Bible said because I read it. Didn't have anybody to instruct me and lead me in a different way. I just got in the presence of God and under the power of the Holy Ghost and read, what does this Bible say? So I got words that are unpleasant because this message is unpleasant. Amen? I talked, a pastor called me in town. You heard this story, sorry, I'm telling it again pastor called me up. I had a man in this church, his name was KG, and another guy named Timothy. And both KG and Timothy were gangster disciples, troublemakers, small boys. They thought they were tough guys, but they were not. And Timothy was getting in my face, and he was about this far from me, and he was acting like he was going to pop me any second. And I was looking for a way out, because I knew that he was going to try to beat me. While I'm speaking to Timothy and watching myself, KG's sneaking up around behind me. And I saw him sneak up around behind me because at the first sign of trouble, he was going to jump me from the backside. God delivered me from all that. And they never laid a hand on me and it never got ugly. Thank you, Jesus. But God, he knows how to deal with people. And after Timothy got evicted from his place, and I was good to these guys. I had given them furniture for their apartment, food. You know, I'd taken care of them, and that's how they repay me. Timothy um, got evicted. KG ended up in the hospital with a heart problem. And then, on top of that, a pastor called me up. He said he went to see KG before he died. And I said, and he said to KG, if you want to get saved, you want God to save you, squeeze my hand. Because KG was so bad at that point, he couldn't get out of bed. About all the strength he had was just to squeeze a hand. And I saw another pastor on television last night, and I was shocked. He was talking about a guy that had HIV, and he was in the hospital dying of AIDS, and he went to go pray for that guy and squeeze my hand. Squeeze my hand. If you want to come to Jesus, squeeze my hand. If you want to come to Jesus, squeeze my hand. Where is it in the Bible? Where is it in the Bible? Where is it in the Bible? Squeeze my hand. It's not in the Bible. It's not here. There's no squeeze my hand. But this pastor's telling people, if you want to get saved, squeeze my hand. It's not in the Bible. And that's what I said. Well, where's that in the Bible? The Bible doesn't say squeeze my hand. Really? Y'all are making this up as you go, aren't you? Yup. Because if you don't know the Word of God, and you don't know what it says, 
There's a thousand other pastors out there that can tell you any kind of story that, that, that is, and you just fall for it. It's a man of God, supposedly. He's dressed in a black shirt with a little white thing up by the collar. Must be legit, right? Squeeze my hand. We're going to sing that one next Sunday. I'll write it all down for you. If you want to come to Jesus, squeeze my hand. What about the sinner's prayer? What about the sinner's prayer? Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry for my sins and for my life. I give myself wholly unto you from today in Jesus' name. And people say, okay, well now, welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the church. You're saved now. It's not in the Bible. What must I do to be saved is not pray a sinner's prayer. You cannot find a single instance of a single human being in the whole entire Bible that prayed a prayer and was added to the church. It's not how it works. The Bible says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. This promise is unto you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call unto himself. What's so hard about that? It's hard. There's water all over the face of the earth. People live near water every time. If you want to get baptized, you can find a place to get baptized. When God impresses upon you the importance of it, of repent and be baptized, you can be baptized. It's not expensive. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It's not difficult. The whole thing is about obedience. Will you do what God called you to do? Amen? Now, how much time did KG have to repent and be baptized? Was he not here in the church? Could I have not gladly illuminated to him the what must I do to be saved if he had been more focused on getting his life right with God than he was on putting a whoop ass on me? You understand, this man had an opportunity to get right with God. And instead of getting right with God, he wanted to do a smackdown on the pastor. And God dealt with him. And God will deal with you too. If you're out there living all kinds of ways and you think you got wisdom, I know what I'm going to do. I know the Bible's right. And I know I need to give my life to God. But I'm smart. I'm going to live my whole life. And then right before I die, that day before I die, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Amen? I'm going to say the sinner's prayer. Gotcha. You've just been reeled in by the devil. You think the devil's not involved in all this stuff? You think he doesn't know how to operate in this world too? I knew a guy. He went to the hospital. He was having chest pains. And probably would have been all right. He probably would have lived a much longer but the hospital decided to give him a good solid dose of morphine. If you know anything about morphine, you know one of the things it does is it shallows your breathing and it slows down your heart rate and takes your pain away. So his breathing got shallow, his heart rate got slower, and his pain went away, and he went to sleep. Four hours later, when the pain medicine wore off, he couldn't even get out of bed anymore. He just moved around on the bed like he was uncomfortable. And they gave him another shot of morphine. And that smoked him right there in the hospital. You don't know what kind of nurses and doctors or people are going to come around you on your last day. You're laying in the hospital bed and they can just mistreat you and send you on to your eternity without God. It's a serious, serious matter. Amen? This walk that we're walking is a serious, serious walk. We're few. The city is large. There's a lot of people out there that don't know God. A lot of people out there that need God like crazy. Amen? And who's going to take them the message? Well, I'm doing everything I can. But I can't do it by myself.
We got to work together as a team. We got to teach people the way of life that they can have an opportunity to get right with God. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Second Chronicles. Chapter 34. Wait in the Chronicles. This is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. It's really a nice, interesting one. Second Chronicles, chapter 34, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. Josiah was one of the best kings I, uh, Judah ever had, an eight-year-old boy. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, and a little child will lead them. Amen. Sometimes the children got more sense than the adults. They know what's not right, and, they, and, the, and they'll just flip and say it because they don't have a filter. That's not right, and they'll just say it. And we're like looking the other way. It's like that old parab um, story about the emperor with no clothes on, walking around butt naked, and everybody's afraid to say anything to him about it. The little kids will rat you out. Hey, Daddy, that man's naked. Yeah, he is. Let's get out of here. You know, verse 3, For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the image that were on high above them he cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images he broke in pieces and made dust of them and strode it on the graves of them that had sacrificed to them, unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even into Naphtali with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and beaten the graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned unto Jerusalem. This king went on World War III on every idol, every idolater, everything that was not the worship of the Most High God, he destroyed it in the whole kingdom. He went after it. Amen? Now what that does, it makes you wildly unpopular with certain people groups. How dare you? That's our idol. That was our father's idol. It's always been like that. How dare you touch that thing? That's untouchable. Amen? we got some idolatry in this country. We've got some stuff that we do that's untouchable. Amen? People flip right out if you limit their access to abortion. There's one. My body, my choice. Uh-huh. You ain't one body, you're two bodies. The moment, and if it were a case of rape, uh, that's a mitigating circumstance. We're not talking most of these cases where it's a case of rape. What it is is women are, for one reason or another, using abortion as birth control. I knew a woman that had nine abortions because she didn't want to have any more kids. Why don't you wear some protection or get on some other form of birth control besides abortion, but that's what they want to do. Amen? There are a few other sacred cows in this country that shall not be named. We know who they are. Because they're militant. Mafia. Rainbow Mafia. They come and get you. Give you trouble. 
So verse 8 starts the rest of the story where they had gotten some money together and started to clean up the house of the Lord. And they were busy cleaning and wiping it down and making it nice, and making it good again. Like this house that was a habitat for jackals. Homeless people had moved in here with the drug needles and the piss bottles and the paraphernalia and the beer bottles and the whiskey bottle and the trash everywhere and the roof was leaking all over the place. And this house was a, was a disaster zone. And God put it on my heart to bring revival into the land. To start with cleaning up the house of God. And by God, that's what we've done. We got the furnaces working, the lights are on, the water's on, the place is cleaned up. We've done some renovations and remodeling and done a lot of work in this house. And it's an honor and a privilege to be a part of a work that is serving God by restoring the house of God. And that's what they did. Verse 14. Bible says, and when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. I don't know how many years it had been. The house of God had actually been shut up for a while prior to this. It had been abandoned completely. And I don't know how many years that scroll of the law of Moses had been remaining in the house of God, and the eyes of man had not seen it. Verse 18, Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the law, he rent his clothes, and the king commanded Hilkiah, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Abdon the son of Micah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Asiah the servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me. He rent his clothes. He ripped them. That's a sign in the olden days. It's like somebody that's just gone mad because they just found out they lost their entire family in a car wreck. You absolutely beside yourself with grief and anger and you just tear your clothes, you tear your hair out. There's absolutely nothing you can do. This man went nuts. He just flipped out when he heard what was in the Word. He knew he was in trouble. Verse 21, Go inquire of the Lord for me. And for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in the book. Amen? Is that not a picture of America? A nation that once was great and served God with all of her heart, and now she's to the point where the Word of God is rare, seldom seen, seldom read, seldom preached. And if you do get the Word of God, it's so contorted and so distorted and so convoluted that you can't even answer a simple question, what must I do to be saved? Your pastor will hem and haw around that question because they don't want to answer it. Because they don't want to segregate the people group, and say, we're God's people, we're saved, and you're on the outside looking in, and if you don't turn from your wicked ways, you're going to remain on the outside, and you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, giving account in the body for everything you've done, whether it be good or bad. They don't want to go there. They're, 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 they're weak. There's a lot of other words that came into my mind, but I couldn't say them. I had to find one. They're pansies. They're girly men. They're not men. They're man pleasers. They're not men of God. They're deceivers. Amen? What does the Bible say? And, and Josiah 
knew that they were in trouble. And the problem was that there was something in the atmosphere and they smelled it. Something doesn't smell right. Something doesn't seem right. Amen? The atmosphere was ripe for a revival. And God had His man. His name was Josiah. And the first thing he did was he dealt with all the enemies of God. He pulled down every stronghold, every idol, everything that people were not doing that was right, and commanded everybody everywhere to repent. Because the first step in revival is repentance. Change your evil ways. Stop walking with the devil and his angels. The second second step to revival is inquire of the Lord. And the report that came back from the Lord was not a good report. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of Judah. And we're talking about Deuteronomy chapter 28, which is one of the most terrifying books that a man can read in the entire Bible. Deuteronomy 28 and 15, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all His commandments and His statutes, which I command thee this day, and all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Thus saith the Lord. Hmm? Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Nothing going to work for you. Cursed shall be thy basket. You're going to not have enough in your basket. Your store is going to be cursed, and it won't work. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy land, and the increase of thine kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings whereby thou hast forsaken me. The Lord shall make the pestilence, make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he hath consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with inflammation and with extreme burning and with the sword and with the blasting and with the mildew and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. You know, he's not done. This thing goes on for probably 10 solid minutes of reading passages just like that all the way through. In other words, you don't obey God, you don't walk with God, you don't do right, brother, Ain't nothing going to work for you. Amen? And this world is full of example after example after example after example. All kinds of people that need God desperately. And they could stand there with a sign that said, I need God desperately, and it couldn't be any more clear to me. I can see in a moment that ain't nothing working in their lives. They don't have a job. They don't have a future. They don't have a hope. They're sick, they're diseased, they're infirm, all kinds of stuff going on. Amen. I had a guy come in here a couple weeks ago. He's got non Hodgkin's lymphoma. He's dying. He can't afford to get his treatments. He's definitely dying. He's sick. He's thin. He's not doing well at all. Come, he was down here in the basement getting warmed up. I said, Man, why don't you come up? Go to church. You never know what God can do. You know, He can heal you all this stuff. You know what He did? I wasn't coming to church, I promise. He ran off, haven't seen him since. The one answer for man is God. There's no other answer. There's no other way. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus and Jesus only. He's the answer man. Amen? He's not the shell answer man. He's the answer man. He's got all the answers. Jesus has your answer in His hand. Jesus 
as the solution in your hand. Amen? Now, Josiah was wise, and he had already gotten a word, ain't nothing going to be all right. There's going to be trouble everywhere. And his prophets had been telling the people they need to repent, and they've been, they've been like, eh, 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 talk to the hand for a long time. And God had been threatening them with Babylonian captivity. And they were not listening. And now we're at that 11th hour. Just about ready to see the Babylonian captivity. People can smell it in the air. The things aren't right. So what do they do? Verse 35, or chapter 35. Bible says, Moreover, Josiah kept a Passover unto the Lord in Jerusalem, and they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. So they got the timing right. And he set priests in their charges and encouraged them to service of the house of the Lord, and said unto the Levites that taught all Israel, which were holy unto the Lord, put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, did build. It shall not be a burden upon your shoulders. Serve now the Lord your God and His people. And it goes on, talks about how they prepared and got everything ready for the Passover. And we're going to pick up in verse 18 of chapter 35. There was no Passover like to that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel. Of all the kings that ruled and reigned in Israel and Judah, there was not a Passover celebration among any of them like the one that Josiah had. The prophet, neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept, and the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel that were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the 18th year of the reign of Josiah was this Passover kept. These guys had a revival. They had a powerful, powerful revival under Josiah's leadership. It started with him being young and tenderhearted. It started with him cleaning up the house of God. It started with him getting a strong rebuke from the Lord that Nothing's going to work, man. You guys are in trouble. And then his response to the Word of God was, well, maybe God is merciful and He'll relent. Let us go ahead and have this Passover revival anyway. And they did it. And it turned into the greatest revival that you can read about in the entire of the Old Testament. Amen? The entire nation of Judah got down on their face, and they sought God with everything they had. That's the good news. The bad news, too little, too late. The destiny clock had already started ticking. Things were already moving in a bad direction for Israel and Judah, and the king of Babylon was about to rise up and put them in captivity for 70 years, according to Jeremiah the prophet, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 25. Amen? We're in the last days. We're at the end of the last days. The Word of God has already pronounced on this world that Jesus is coming for real. But before He comes, there's going to be a revival in this land. People are going to come to church again. They're going to seek God with everything they have. Amen? We started small. We started with this church being a mess. It was cleaned in the Holy Ghost. It was cleaned in the natural. Just like Josiah cleaned the temple. And we had the Word of God, but it's now being proclaimed from this pulpit. And I pray that it was always proclaimed like this. This is as strong as I know how to put it. 
I don't shrink back. I don't pull punches. I don't speak any kind of way. I'm telling you what the Bible says. And I am encouraging you to get into the Word of God. And I know that we're in the Word of God because I've talked to some of you and I know you guys are reading the Bible. But for like the next seven days, I want you to dedicate yourself to the study of the Word of God and to prayer. I want you to seek God with all your heart. We are on another precipice. Amen? I hate invoking 9-11. That was a terrible day. But it did do one thing positive. It made America pray again. Is that what it takes for you guys to serve God? The trouble be so great that there's no way out of it like these people had on those days in 9-11? Trust me, God knows how to get your attention. He knows what to do. He knows how to move in your life. He knows how to shake and do and be because He's God. Amen? Those curses were for a purpose. They were to make you come to Him again. Amen? Lord Jesus, thank You for this Word. Thank You for touching Your people with it. May it fall on fertile soil and change hearts and minds and destinies forever and ever and ever. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank You, Father.